I was 10 years old when grandma came to live with us. It was about six months after granddad passed away, and I guess, looking back, she must have been lonely in that big house of theirs. Rattling around with only the grief and memories for company. So despite a few protests from mom, my parents took her in. There were no protests from me. None at all. Grandma was loud and fun, and I loved her. She had an almost limitless supply of boiled sweets, and she'd always slip me a couple whenever she saw me. She was always the first to stick up for me when I got in trouble, too. But it was her stories I loved best. Grandma had all kinds of stories. Stories about growing up during World War II, and stories about the things she'd get up to with her friends on the South Coast after her family had been evaluated. Sad stories, funny stories, adventure stories. But it was her scary stories that were my favorite. Grandma had lots of scary stories. She told me she dabbled in the occult when she was a teenager, trying out Ouija boards with her friends. Tarot cards, fortune telling. All that stuff. Most of the stories I'd laugh off or forget about not long after she was done telling them, but there were a couple that really did spook me a bit. I was only 10 at the time, you have to understand. And Grandma certainly knew how to bring the stories to life. She'd shut off the lights in my room so only the glow of the night sky shone through the curtains, and she'd shuffle in real close. Close enough so I could see the wrinkles on her face and smell the boiled sweets on her breath. Close enough so her deep blue eyes could stare straight into mine. She must have given me nightmares with a few of those tales, but now, years later, there's only one that I can still remember. Only one that stuck with me. The story about the shower and Mr. Longfingers. Grandma told me about Mr. Longfingers one night after I asked about her baths. Grandma used to love her baths. She'd spend ages in them, light candles and incense, and lie in the tub humming to herself until the water turned cold. It drove my mom crazy. But when I asked her why she loved them so much, she said it was the only place she could relax. It was the only place that was safe for her to relax. You know people like me, who are, well, more sensitive to certain things, we have to have baths, she told me seriously one night, shuffling closer on the bed. I couldn't possibly spend that long in the shower. It'd be far too risky. Grandma stared at me with those blue eyes of hers, unsmiling, and I knew it was time for one of her stories. One of the scary ones. I shivered with pleasure and pulled the covers up to my chin. Why is it risky, Grandma? She half turned to look out the window, watching me from the corner of her eye. Pausing for effect. I waited, feeling my heart rate pick up ever so slightly in my chest. Well, she said after a moment, it's only risky if you close your eyes, of course. If you close your eyes for longer than 10 seconds. What do you mean? Why? Well, do you ever play that game in the playground with your friends? The one where someone turns their back and the others sneak up on them when they're not looking? I nodded and grandma nodded back. Exactly. So that's what it's like in the shower when you have your eyes closed. That's what it's like with Mr. Longfingers. A cold itch tickled back. Who's Mr. Longfingers, Grandma? She let out a deep breath as if she wished she hadn't said anything. Turned her head back to face mine. When she next spoke, she'd lowered her voice. No one knows exactly, Grandma whispered. Some think it's a creature that's attracted to the heat and smell we give off in there. Others think it's a demon that finds a way into our realm through the dense steam clouds. No one can say for sure, because the only ones who have actually seen Mr. Longfingers aren't ever going to be able to tell you. I pulled in a breath. Why not? Grandma shuffled closer along the bed and leaned towards me, leaving my question hanging in the air. Don't you worry about it, sweetheart. Don't worry your pretty head. As long as you remember the rules, you'll be fine. What rules? Well, when you're in the shower, you try not to close your eyes for too long. Five seconds is fine, and ten is just about okay, too. But any longer than that. Yeah? Then what? 
Well, any longer than that, and you may just start to feel something in the room with you. Something watching. And if you ever go longer than 15 seconds, that's when you might start to hear a noise, too. Hear what? The soft tap 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 of fingers on glass. Fingers drumming against the glass door of the shower. If you do ever hear that noise, God forbid, will you make me a promise? What, Grandma? Promise me you'll never open your eyes. I barely slept that night. Hardly at all. I'd close my eyes and try to relax, but every time I did I'd imagine a face pressed against my bedroom window, staring in at me. And when I did finally get to sleep, I had nightmares. Bad ones. I had them all week, in fact. Dreams about disembodied eyes watching me in the dark, and long fingers reaching out to touch my exposed skin. It wasn't any better when I was awake either. Not really. The shower was the worst. That's when Grandma's story really got to me. I'd never thought about it before, but suddenly I had trouble shutting my eyes in there. I'd be standing beneath the beating water, shampoo running down my face, and as soon as I squinted my eyelids closed I'd hear Grandma's words running through my head. Five seconds is fine, and ten is just about okay, too. But any longer than that. I'd rub my hair fast, feeling the shampoo dripping off my chin, and as soon as I'd counted past five seconds I'd feel it. A sort of pressure. Not a feeling of being watched, exactly but something close to that. I'd run my fingers faster and faster through my hair, frantically trying to get the suds out, and the ready blackness behind my closed eyes coupled with the rush of water and in my ears would feel like a held breath. Like the silence before a scream. The seconds would race through my mind and I'd be so desperate to open my eyes again that I'd sometimes do it before my hair was rinsed fully clean and my eyes would sting with shampoo. But before I shut them again, I'd always be sure to peer out through the steamed glass door of the shower cubicle. Just to make sure I was still alone. It wasn't long before Mum realized something was up. She heard me crying out in my sleep one night and came in to comfort me. Asked me what the matter was, and it all came out. I told her about Grandma's stories and about Mr. Longfingers. She got this look on her face when I was telling her like she used to get with me when I'd made her really mad. This wide-eyed, angry look. Only this time she wasn't angry with me. She was angry with Grandma. My parents' room was next to mine, and sometimes, if I pressed my ear against the wall, I could hear them talking in there. Soft whispers. That night, though, after Mum was satisfied, I wasn't scared anymore and she'd gone back to her room, the whispers weren't soft at all. Oh no. I heard Mum hissing to Dad about Grandma. About the story she'd told me. Mum's voice floated through the wall, sharp and crisp. You know what your fucking mother said to him now, don't you, Simon? Dad's response was an unintelligible mutter. She's told him there's a monster that'll get him if he shuts his eyes in the shower. A monster. The poor kid's been having nightmares about it all week. Seriously, Simon, you'd better say something to her tomorrow morning, first thing. Or I will. Grandma came to visit me in my room the following night. That time, as she perched on the end of my bed, there were no stories. Nothing like that. Grandma just sat there and stared down at me, her blue eyes wide and sad. The light from the moon outside my window lit up her wrinkled face. You know I'd never let anything bad happen to you, don't you? She said after a moment. I nodded my head. I know, Grandma. You know I wouldn't let you come to any harm? I nodded again. Okay, good. That's good. She looked away from me for a moment, out the window. You know, the things I tell you in the evening are meant to help you, sweetheart. They're meant to toughen you up a bit. Protect you. She paused and shook her head. But maybe your mom's right. Maybe I went too far this time. She looked down at me and smiled. But even then, even though I was only ten years old, I could tell it didn't quite reach her eyes. I'll tell you what. Grandma said, You know what I told you about Mr. Longfingers and the shower? Well, I'm going to make sure you're safe. 
I'll scare the bastard off. How about that? It won't come back in a hurry if it has to face me. I stared up at Grandma, watching her face glow in the moonlight. Watching her smile down at me. I nodded my head, once. I was the one who found her. I don't know when exactly it happened, but I guess it was about a week after we had that talk in my room. A week after she told me she wouldn't let me come to any harm. I woke early that morning, from a bad dream, to a heavy thumping sound. I sat bolt upright in bed. My room was quiet around me, and I couldn't hear anything from the wall that joined my parents' room either. But the house wasn't entirely silent. Floating down the hall, muffled by my closed door, I could hear the sound of rushing water. The noise of the shower. I leapt out of bed and ran down the upstairs hallway, heart already pounding in my chest. As soon as I reached the closed bathroom door, I started banging on it. A deep terror was welling up inside me like cold water from a well, something I couldn't place, and I kept banging and shouting grandma over and over again, even though she didn't respond. Off to my right I was dimly aware of voices from my parents' room, the sleepy shuffle of footsteps, but before they had a chance to make it out onto the landing I'd lifted my hand to test out the door handle, more out of instinct than because I thought it might actually open. But the door wasn't locked. I kept banging with my free hand and it swung suddenly inwards, bringing me face to face with a wall of steam. Heat struck my skin. I squinted my eyes against the damp fog and peered into the bathroom. And before dad pushed me to one side, before everything around me descended into shouting and tears and chaos, I saw her. I saw grandma. She was lying naked on the floor in the shower cubicle, the water beating down around her. Blue eyes bulging from her face. One hand was curled against her chest, like a dead bird, while the other trailed against the glass of the shower cubicle, the flailing finger marks she carved through the steam still clear and fresh. It was a heart attack that killed her. That's what my dad told me. He said grandma was old, and the thing had struck her quickly and suddenly. She would have died fast and without pain, dad said. She wouldn't have suffered. I knew better, though. Even as a 10-year-old kid, I knew better. And years later, writing this as an adult, I still know better. I also know my wife and kids resent me for refusing to have a shower in the house. For insisting everyone take baths. They pretend it's okay, and they humor me, but I can tell they don't really understand it. Not at all. My wife thinks she does. She thinks I still carry the trauma of seeing my grandmother dying in front of me when I was little. I guess she's right, in a way. But she doesn't know the full truth. Nobody does. And no one would believe me even if I told them. No one would believe me if I said the reason I don't take showers, the reason I haven't had one since I was 10 years old, isn't because I'm scarred from the sight of a dead body. It's because all those years ago, when I crept back into the still hot bathroom after the paramedics had taken grandma's body downstairs, I made sure to check the marks her fingers had carved through the steamed glass of the shower cubicle. And those marks weren't just on the inside. It's starting to come back to me. Slowly, bit by bit. I don't know if it was opening up about my grandma's other bedtime story that did it, or the fact my wife finally persuaded me to try counseling, but whatever the reason, the memories are returning. Memories from my childhood. Memories of grandma. Memories of the stories she used to tell me before I went to sleep. See, I always knew there were others. Other tales that scared me when I was little. But the time before I was a teenager is like a dark landscape, only a few small patches are lit up. It's getting clearer now, though. The shadows that litter that black land are finally being forced to retreat. The thing is, I'm not sure I want to see what they've been hiding. I must have been around seven years old when Grandma told me about the special knock. I was tucked up in bed at my parents' first house, in my little room at the back, at the time. Grandma was perched by my feet. I'd been crying. I don't know what upset me, but I remember my eyes blurring and my nose running. I remember probing a cut in my lip, touching it over and over again with my tongue. I remember the frown on Grandma's face. 
a look that was half concern, half something else. After she'd grabbed a tissue from me and wiped my face, she got up and walked away from the bed. Wandered over to the cupboard on the opposite side of my room. I remember that cupboard well. Before we moved to our second home, that cupboard was the source of many sleepless nights for me. Many nightmares. I used to imagine all sorts of things about it. I'd lie awake, sometimes for hours, and I'd have to keep peeking my eyes open to check the cupboard door was still closed. To make sure it was shut tight. See, whenever my eyes were closed and I heard a creak somewhere in the house, I'd imagine it was the cupboard door. That something on the far side was trying to open it, ever so softly, so it could come and get me while I slept. I'd never told anyone about this fear. Even at seven years old, I knew it was stupid. Baby stuff. But as I watched my grandma stop in front of the cupboard and lean her wrinkled cheek against the wood, I felt myself growing tense all the same. Even though the lights were on. Even though there was an adult in the room with me. And when grandma closed her eyes and started whispering, I had to fight back the urge to shout for my parents. Grandma? I could hear the uncertainty in my voice. Grandma, what are you doing? For a few more seconds she didn't respond. Just kept her eyes closed and kept muttering. Then, abruptly, she turned to face me again. Smiled. And when she came back and resumed her usual position at the foot of my bed, I knew it was story time. Did I ever tell you about the special knock, sweetheart? I shook my head. No? Hmm, well maybe I was waiting until you were a bit older. The special knock can be wonderful, it can lead you to see things you wouldn't even be able to conjure up in dreams, but it can also be, well, dangerous. Grandma glanced away from me, towards the bedroom door. Maybe it's one for another time, in fact. I really should be getting home to see your grandfather, and I wouldn't want to scare you. She started to get up from the bed, but I stopped her. No, don't go, Grandma. What's the special knock? Grandma's blue eyes twinkled. She hovered where she was for a moment, then sat back down. The special knock is an old trick a friend of mine taught me when I was younger, she began. Not everyone can do it, and not everyone would want to do it. You have to be brave, and careful, and, well, special. Grandma smiled at me. Like you. As I watched her, she reached into the front pocket of her cardigan and pulled out two boiled sweets. Passed one to me. I'd already brushed my teeth, and I knew Mom would kill me if she caught me eating sweets before bed. But this was my time alone with Grandma. Mom was downstairs with Dad. She'd never know. I unwrapped the sweet and popped it in my mouth, feeling the sticky mint wash over my tongue. The cut in my lips stung slightly, but I ignored it. When Grandma next spoke, she'd lowered her voice. When I was over by your cupboard door just now, I was using the magic words. Secret words that only a few other people know. Do you know what those words do? I shook my head. They turn a door into a window. A sort of gateway. The thing is, sweetheart, this place you spend your days in, this house where you live, and the building you go to school in, and the town you visit with your mother at the weekends, it's not the only place. There are other places, too. And if you use the special knock on that cupboard door of yours now that I've whispered the magic words to it, you'll see them. You'll be able to see those other places for yourself. I stared at Grandma, concentrating on her words. Absorbing them. Mint flooded my mouth, but I forgot to swallow. Now listen to me very carefully, Grandma continued. Because this is the important bit. The way you open the window is by doing the special knock, but you have to get it right. Seven knocks on the door, that's what you'll want. Seven knocks. No more, no less. Then you open it. You won't be able to step through, but you'll have one heck of a view, all right. I swallowed. A view of what? I don't know its real name, but the woman who taught me the special knock had her own name for it. She called it the lunar plane. Seven knocks takes you to the lunar plane. I could try and describe it to you, sweetheart, but I honestly don't think I could do it justice. 
You just have to see it for yourself. All I'll say is it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And trust me, I've seen plenty. Grandma plucked the sweet wrappers up from the duvet. Put them back in their pocket. She put her hands on her legs, as if bracing herself to stand. Then she paused. How many knocks did I say? Seven, Grandma. That's right. Seven. Don't forget it either. If you get the wrong number, and then open the door. She glanced across at the cupboard and frowned. Well, just make sure you don't get the wrong number, okay? Okay, Grandma. And will you make me a promise? What? If you do somehow knock the wrong number of times, especially if that number happens to be 13 or something close to it, then whatever you do, don't open the door. Okay? Don't open it, no matter what you hear on the other side. The last thing you want is to open a gateway to the Blacklands. I felt icy fingers down my back. I glanced across at the closed cupboard door and the shadows at the far end of my bedroom. What's the Blacklands? Grandma stood up and wandered over to me, leaned down and gave me a kiss. You don't want to know, she whispered. I spent the next week avoiding the cupboard. I didn't go anywhere near it. Tried not to even look in its direction. Did my best to push Grandma's story as far out of my mind as I could. It wasn't easy. Whenever I was alone in my room and the house was silent, I'd feel it. A sort of pull. Like when someone tells you not to look at something and suddenly all you want to do is take a quick peek. The feeling was sort of like that, but it was different, too. Stronger. Sometimes, when I was lying in bed at night, I'd feel the cupboard almost like a weight in my mind. A heavy, static energy. It made me restless, made me want to scrunch up my fists and grit my teeth. When I turned away from the cupboard, my skin itched. Like the pores had tiny, invisible bugs in them. It made it hard for me to sleep. And when I did sleep, I had dreams. Sometimes the dreams were pleasant, floaty ones. I'd dream I was on a cloud, hovering through multicolored planes of light, flying through an endless sea of stars. I'd wake from these dreams feeling happy and safe, like how I felt when Mum hugged me and stroked my hair. But other times, I had nightmares. The nightmares I had during that week were the worst I ever remembered having in my life. Horrible, half-glimpsed blurs. Images I'd wake from with a scream lodged in my throat, my sweat-soaked pajamas sticking to the skin of my back. At the time, I didn't remember the nightmares themselves. At least not completely. But every time I woke from one, I was left with the same, fading image. An image of myself surrounded by thick, choking blackness. Dense shadows everywhere. I couldn't see a thing, but I had the sense that I was standing at the center of a vast open space. Wind howled around me. Sounds echoed. I wanted to open my mouth and yell for help, but I couldn't bring myself to. Because I knew I wasn't alone. It was a week after Grandma's story that I used a special knock. It was a Saturday night, and my friend from school, Tim Jacobs, was round. We were having a sleepover. It's been a long, long time since I last saw Tim, but I can still picture him. Even though he was a month younger than me, I always remember him looking older, a tall, broad-shouldered kid with green eyes and messy blonde hair. A half-smirk permanently on his face. Tim was one of the most popular kids in our year, and in normal circumstances he wouldn't have had anything to do with me. But our dads were friends from way back, and we'd known each other our whole lives. As Tim often liked to remind the kids at school, he was forced to hang out with me. When are you going to get a TV in your room? Or a computer? Tim sat in his pajamas, slumped in the chair by my desk. He was fiddling with my desk lamp, switching it on and off. His face lit up with light, then disappeared, then lit up again. This wasn't the first time Tim had asked me a question like this. Whenever we had sleepovers at my house, he spent the whole time moaning about my lack of stuff. No TV, no computer. No PlayStation. I had board games, and I had books, but that was about it. 
and Tim had no interest in those things. You know my mom won't let me, I muttered back. It was 10 p.m., and we were both speaking in half whispers. We'd been told to go to sleep at 9 p.m., and mom had already been up to give us one warning for talking. I knew from past experience that one warning was all you wanted to get, mom had a short fuse, and she wouldn't be above grounding me if I wasn't careful. I knew we were safe if we kept our voices low, though. Mom and Dad were both downstairs in the lounge, watching TV. Some film. The faint, tinny sound of laughter drifted upstairs every now and then. As long as we weren't too loud, they wouldn't hear us. I glanced warily at Tim, who was still fiddling with the lamp. He was in a restless mood. He'd been silent and sullen most of the evening, rolling his eyes whenever I suggested stuff for us to do. Bad signs. From knowing him so long, I knew he could get reckless when he was bored. Reckless and mean. You know what I think, said Tim now, keeping his eyes on the lamp. He was talking slowly and carefully, punctuating his words with a flick of the lamp switch. What I think. Switch. Light. Is that your mom? Switch. Dark. Is a bitch. Switch. Light. He put extra emphasis on bitch, savoring the bad word. The adultness of it. Then he stared across the room at me, fixing his green eyes on mine. I felt my own eyes prickle and suddenly had to fight to hold back tears. I looked away from Tim and my eyes found the cupboard. I know what we could do, I said suddenly. Tim followed my gaze. I'm not playing any more of your stupid board games, he said. That's kid stuff. No, this isn't board games. This is a secret my, I caught myself. A secret someone showed me. Yeah? What secret? Tim's voice still had an edge to it. But at the same time, I could tell I'd caught his interest. This was my best tool when Tim was in a bad mood, distraction. If I argued or disagreed with him, he'd only make fun of me more, but if I could get his mind on something else, I might be okay. So basically, there's this special knock someone taught me, I said now. If I do a special knock on that cupboard door, then open it, we'll be able to see something really cool. Tim rolled his eyes. Yeah, right. No, really. A, a witch taught me how to do it. She cast a spell on the door. And now I can take us anywhere we want to go just by knocking on it. Tim stood up from the chair by my desk. The lamplight spilled over his face. His expression was half smirk, half scowl. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard, he said. It's dumb even for you. How about instead of knocking on the door, I knock on your head a bunch of times? How about that? He took a step towards me, and I panicked. Well, if you're too scared to try it, I'll understand. This was a big risk, and I knew it. But as soon as the words were out, Tim paused. Why the hell would I be scared? I'm not scared of nothing. I shrugged. Well, the spell the witch did is dangerous. Really dangerous. Like, if we get the number of knocks wrong, and I do more than I should, we could go someplace bad. Tim glanced across at the cupboard door, then looked back at me. His face was hard to read. Wait, so how many knocks is it meant to be, then? Seven, I said quickly. Seven takes us to this awesome place. But the witch told me that if we get the knocks wrong, especially if we get close to thirteen, or something like that, then the door opens someplace different. Someplace scary. Tim was no longer scowling. He looked across at the cupboard door again, a slight frown on his face. After a few more seconds, he shrugged his shoulders. Okay, go on then. Let's try it. The brief wave of relief I felt was extinguished as soon as I turned to the cupboard door. It stood a few feet away from me, just outside the glow of the desk lamp. In the shadows. It seemed stupid to think that the cupboard wasn't anything more than just a cupboard. Baby stuff. But then again, as I looked at it, I remembered the dreams I'd been having all week. The nightmares. And grandma's words from the previous weekend floated back to me. 
If you get the wrong number and then open the door. Grandma hadn't had her storytelling face on when she'd warned me about getting the number wrong. She'd had her serious face on. I was sure of it. As though she really meant what she was saying. And what was it she'd said about 13 knocks? If you do somehow knock the wrong number of times, especially if that number happens to be 13 or something close to it, then whatever you do, don't open the door. Okay? Don't open it, no matter what you hear on the other side. I shivered. Still, that was all right, wasn't it? I just have to make sure I only knocked seven times. I'd count as I went. Easy peasy. I pulled in a deep breath and stepped towards the cupboard. Felt Tim's eyes on me. From downstairs, at the edge of my hearing, I caught laughter floating up from the lounge. It's okay, I told myself. Your parents are just downstairs. And besides, nothing's really going to happen, is it? Grandma can't really turn doors magic. Get on with it, said Tim. If you're going to do your special needs knock, or whatever the hell it is, then do it, okay? Don't just stand there. I ignored him. By now I was directly in front of the cupboard door. I could feel that tingle again, too. That pressure. Beneath my pajamas, my skin was all goosebumps. It might only have been the slight chill in my bedroom, and nothing more than that. But then again, I knew it was more than that. I could feel it in my mind. A heaviness that was like the start of a headache. A pull behind my eyes. As I reached up and made my right hand into a fist, it felt like I was no longer in control of my body. Knock. I struck the wood with my fist, softly. The sound was dull and hollow. I felt Tim at the edge of my vision, moving up beside me. Somewhere in the distance, I heard a faint sound. At first I thought it was noise from the TV downstairs, but then I thought it might be coming from outside my bedroom window, and then it sounded as though it was all around me, and finally, as my fist struck the door for the seventh time, I realized what the sound was, a whistle. A faint, low hum. Coming from inside the cupboard. The echo of my final knock faded, melting into the noise beyond the door. My skin tingled. I stepped forwards, almost in a trance, my hand reaching for the doorknob. And then I felt myself shoved to one side as Tim pushed past me. Bang, before I had a chance to stop him, or even so much as call out, Tim had thumped his fist against the door six more times making the total number of knocks 13. Beyond the cupboard, the whistling sound stopped. Tim reached out and gripped the doorknob. My words were only a half whisper, but something in my voice made Tim pause. Still clutching the doorknob, he turned to look at me, and the grin on his face grew wider as he saw the fear on mine. When he next spoke, his voice was a parody of shock and concern. Oh no! Did I get the special needs knock wrong? Did I make it all scary for poor little Christopher? Tim pouted out his lower lip. Is little Christopher scared of the big bad monsters in the cupboard? I listened for the whistling noise beyond the door, for any noise beyond the door, but could no longer hear anything. Don't open it, Tim. I'm serious. Oh, you're serious, are you? Oh, okay. I didn't realize how serious you were. I wouldn't want you telling your mummy on me. Tim took his hand away from the door and rolled his eyes. Turned away. I felt my body begin to untense. But just as I was turning away, too, Tim spun back round and grabbed for the doorknob. Terror rolled through me in a sick wave. I turned just in time to see the cupboard door flying open. I opened my mouth to scream, but the sound died in my throat when I saw what was on the other side. Nothing. Nothing at all. Just some clothes hanging up, and toys littering the floor. The exact same view I had whenever I looked in the cupboard. Nothing else. Oh wow, the look on your face. I turned to see Tim with his hands on his knees, his body shaking with laughter. You looked like you were gonna wet yourself. Oh, Chris, the guys at school are gonna love this. I felt my cheeks burning. 
I turned away from Tim and stared into the shadows of the cupboard. Told myself I wouldn't cry. Told myself Tim would be gone in the morning, anyway. I turned away from the cupboard and walked back across my room, towards my single bed. Where are you going? To sleep. Ah, uh, what's wrong, Christopher? Did your special needs cupboard not work? Shut up. I was halfway across the room by that point, but when the cupboard door slammed shut behind me, I jumped. I looked back and saw Tim standing in front of it, staring after me. No longer laughing. What did you just say? Just leave me alone, Tim. I'm going to sleep, and you should as well. If you keep banging around, Mum's gonna hear you, and then we'll both get grounded. Tim's frown deepened for a moment, and then faded. He glanced towards the bedroom door. As he paused to listen, I knew he could hear what I heard, footsteps on the stairs. The TV had gone off, and my parents were getting ready for bed. Tim looked back at me and shrugged, but when he next spoke, he'd lowered his voice. Whatever, I'm bored anyway. There's never anything to do round here. He made his way over to his sleeping bag, which was set up near the bedroom door. I walked over to my desk and switched the lamp off, then made my own way to bed. I suddenly felt exhausted. As I clambered under the covers I heard Tim's voice, a soft hiss in the darkness. Night night, Christopher. Don't let the cupboard monsters bite. His laughter followed me into an uneasy sleep. It was a noise that woke me. A soft tapping, like fingertips drumming on wood. I had a vision of Tim at my desk, tapping his fingers against the surface while he switched the lamp on and off. But when I creaked my eyes open, the room was still dark. And my desk chair was empty. Tap, tap. I hadn't dreamed it. The sound was still there, constant and steady. Tap, tap. Coming from the far side of the bedroom. Dread surged through my chest and stomach, forcing me fully awake. I lifted my head from my pillow, slowly, and peered into the shadows. Tim was standing in front of the cupboard. His back facing towards me. Blonde hair sticking up in clumps, still messy from sleep. As I watched, he took a step closer to it. Then another. Finally, he began to reach out a hand, as if in slow motion, for the cupboard's doorknob. Tim. I spoke in a low hiss. Tim, what are you doing? He didn't react. Just kept reaching his hand out, his fingertips now inches from the door. Tap, tap. The sound was growing louder, more insistent. It was coming from inside the cupboard. As I kicked back the duvet and swung my legs out, Grandma's words raced through my mind. Whatever you do, don't open the door. Don't open it, no matter what you hear on the other side. Tim. I hissed his name again as my feet hit the carpet. He didn't react. From the way he was moving, I had the idea he might still be unconscious. Either that or in some sort of trance. Louder still. As I hurried across the room, Tim's fingertips found the doorknob. The tapping sound stopped. I skidded to a stop a few feet from where he stood, terror rooting me in place. Tim. Don't. He half stirred. I saw his head move, turning slightly towards me. I caught a glimpse of one green eye, open but glazed. Then Tim tugged the door open. The hinges squealed as it moved. Tim hadn't put much force behind his pull, so the door creaked open slowly, and it didn't open all the way, only about a foot. But that was enough. It was enough for me to glimpse the swirling, ink-thick blackness beyond. A darkness that was far too dense to be explained away with shadows. It was enough for me to hear the distant howling, like storm wind battering the eaves of a dilapidated house. And it was enough for me to feel a sense of dread that was worse than anything I'd ever felt before in my life. Tim, wake up. My voice wasn't any louder, but this time it seemed to get through. Tim let go of the doorknob. He turned towards me. I saw him blink rapidly, saw the glazed look leave his face. For a second, his green eyes found mine. He opened his mouth to say something, and then long fingers stretched from the cupboard and found his throat. 
I didn't scream. I couldn't. I couldn't only stare on, in shock, as the fingers wrapped themselves around his neck. Tim tried to speak, but he couldn't. He could only make the same strangled noise, like a baby struggling to make itself understood. I listened to that noise in horror, still rooted to the spot. Time was moving impossibly slowly. I don't know how long I stood there, frozen in place on the carpet. I only know it was long enough. Long enough for me to get a clear view of those fingers, which were like a cross between tree branches and tentacles tightening on Tim's throat. Long enough for me to see his strained face turning from red to purple, to watch as the veins in his forehead stood out like worms beneath the skin. Long enough for me to see him stretching out a hand towards me, the fingers flailing in my direction while the terror grew on his face. That was what finally snatched me out of my shock, Tim's hand. Something about seeing Tim, a kid who dominated playgrounds and sports fields for as long as I'd known him, reaching out towards me with desperation in his eyes. Without pausing to think what I was doing, I ran forwards and grabbed him. I grabbed his hand. For just a second, I felt his grip tightening on mine. Wind howled in the distance. My eyes locked on Tim's. And then, with the force of a plaster being ripped from a cut, Tim was snatched backwards. One minute he was holding my hand, the next he'd vanished. I had a brief impression of him flying through the air, screaming as he was pulled through the dark gap in the cupboard's door, then he was gone. His cry swallowed by the distant wind. I stared down at my empty hand, too many emotions raging through me to process, and only looked up again when I heard the crash of the cupboard door banging shut. By the time I heard footsteps and voices on the landing beyond my room, I'd started to cry. Tim was never seen again. Gone, without a trace. When my parents first came into my bedroom that night, they thought it was all a game. Hide and seek got out of hand. I kept telling them Tim was in the cupboard, but whenever my dad opened it to check he couldn't find anything. Just the same old piles of clothes and toys. Later, when the police came, I told them the same thing I'd eventually told my parents, that I'd seen something grab Tim and pull him into the cupboard. A hand that came out of the darkness and wrapped itself around his neck. None of them believed me. Why would they have? Looking back, I can see myself through their eyes, just an upset, terrified little kid whose friend had gone missing. Maybe they thought I'd had a nightmare, or maybe they thought I had seen something, an abductor pulling Tim through the bedroom window, perhaps, but my mind-frightened mind had simply confused the details. Either way, whenever I mentioned the cupboard, they dismissed it. There was only one person who didn't. We were already in our new home when I next saw Grandma. Our second one, a few towns over. At the time, I hadn't really understood why we were moving. I'd overheard Dad telling Mom that the talking would never stop if we didn't leave, but I hadn't really got what he meant. I didn't care, though. Moving meant I could go to a new school and get away from all the whispering kids in the playground. It also meant I'd never have to see Tim's mom, who turned up outside the school gates one day to scream questions at me again. But mostly, it meant I could get away from the cupboard. It meant I could sleep. My parents had eventually set my bed up in the spare room when I refused to step back in my own bedroom, but even that hadn't helped. Not really. Because I still knew it was in there. I could still feel it. The thought of that cupboard was like a horrible itch in my mind. I kept wanting to scratch at it, but that only made it worse. Moving house got me far away from it, once and for all. And a couple of weeks after we'd moved, I finally saw Grandma. I'd been asking mom and dad if I could see her ever since the night Tim disappeared, but they kept putting me off. Said it wasn't the right time, and I could see grandma once everything was more settled. But finally, after our furniture was moved in and they grew fed up with my pestering, I got my wish. Grandma came round for the evening, and at bedtime I asked if she could come up to tuck me in. She agreed. The second the door to my new room was shut, I started babbling telling her about the cupboard door and the special knock about how we knocked 13 times about what happened to Tim she listened at first but as I grew more and more worked up she finally came over and started stroking my hair shoo sweetheart grandma whispered 
It's okay. It's going to be okay. You're safe now. But can the thing in the cupboard find me here? What? No, no. You don't need to worry about anything in the cupboard. The magic words only work once, and I don't have to use them again if you don't want me to. I meant you're safe from him. From who? From that boy who was bullying you, sweetheart. From Timothy. Grandma smiled and stroked my cheek. Your little friend's in the Blacklands now. The temperature in my room was warm, but my skin suddenly felt cold. I stared up at Grandma. What? What do you mean? She sighed. Don't you remember when I last came to see you, and I tucked you in? You'd been crying, and you had a cut lip. And before I told you about the special knock, you told me that your friend, a boy called Timothy, had tripped you up in the playground. You said he did it in front of the girls in your class, and they'd all laughed at you. I stared at Grandma, thought back to the last time I'd seen her. I remembered the feeling of having cried recently, and I remembered the cut in my lip. Remembered probing at it with my tongue while Grandma spoke. But I couldn't remember telling her about Tim tripping me. Tim was I grasped for the right words and came up short. Tim's my friend, Grandma. Well, I'll tell you something for free, sweetheart. Anyone who hurts you to make themselves feel bigger is not your friend. Grandma frowned for a second, then smiled again. But like I said, you don't need to worry about him anymore. Timothy's in the Blacklands, and he'll never get out. Grandma leaned down towards me. Her breath smelled like sweets and mint. I can't have anyone hurting my Christopher, can I? Now, give your grandma a big kiss and say thank you. She leaned closer to me. There were so many questions and emotions swirling through me that my head felt like it was going to burst. I almost flinched away from grandma, but I stopped myself at the last minute. As her face came closer to mine, instinct kicked in. Thank you, grandma, I mumbled, giving her a kiss on the cheek. You're welcome, Christopher, she whispered.